let's go. This uh, in the past was called a complicated lock free queue. Uh, overly comp this it got more and more complicated, and then yesterday uh, it became simpler. So it's not so complicated anymore. Although yesterday it became simpler, and by the end of yesterday it's starting to get a little complicated again. Um, before I dive into anything, um, I, people have been asking me, because I started a new job, I work at Christie now, who makes projectors, which, don't tell them I say this, but this, that is kind of, sounds kind of boring. Uh, but what I do at Christie is you take a bunch of projectors and you turn them into a single image, right? Um, or you put it on a curve, this, that's a big giant curve simulation screen. Or you put it on a car, um, like that, that's a, like life-size car, that's, that car's gray. It's a, that's a like flat gray car. Um, and, uh, or things like this, where you just put your little gray drag in there and you run some light on it, you look at the light, and then you know where the dragon is. So that's the kind of stuff I work on. Um, or you do it to big giant buildings in Red Square. Right? So that, there's a video on YouTube of that, like the colors and everything changing and and it, it's really well aligned with every edge of the building is really well aligned. Um, so that has nothing to do with my talk, but um, Christy's very supportive of me coming to the C++ community, so. And I, and I just think it's really cool stuff, so I'm Keep pretty happy that. Keep people ask me. I've been asking all week, what am I doing now? So that's what I'm working on. Okay, um, I always put this up when uh, at the start of my talks. If you're doing threaded, just don't share data. And if you have to share data, use logs, okay? But step one, just don't share data. Make a copy of your data, put the copy on a separate thread. Uh, my other talk this week was about don't call unknown code, code when you're holding a lock, like a virtual function or a, a standard function or something like that. You don't know what it's gonna do because it's gonna grab another lock and you're gonna end up deadlocking. And then measure your code and then measure it again because measuring is hard and your first measurement was wrong. And then change your algorithm probably by going back to one and stop sharing so much. And you'll notice that this algorithm loops forever. And lock free is at infinity because you never want to do lock free coding. All right? it's, it's like the last thing you want to do and it's only if you can't get performance. And after you've done your lock free coding, you better measure again because you, there's no guarantee you got any better performance out of it. You can get worse performance depending on the scenario. And, and you know, test, verify, prove, because it's really hard to test lock-free code to know that it works. So we'll, we'll talk a little bit, just a tiny bit about how would you verify lock-free code. Um, so don't share and use locks. So therefore, that's the end of the talk, because. <laughs> OK, oh, and my guide to coding in general, macros are evil. Jo is John here? John Lakos is the only one allowed. He's allowed to use them. He's, he's the exception. Uh, and that's why I put that in comic sans because it's that evil. <laughs> that has nothing to do with my talk either. I just I have a, an audience so I get I get to say I get to say that. Um, in my code, I'm gonna cram a lot of code on the slide, so I'm not gonna spell out compare exchange, I'm gonna call it CAS because that's what it used to be called. Uh, compare and swap. And so this is not really uh, indicative of my coding style. It's, it can get kind of <laughs> ugly. Um, but anyhow, we're going to talk about this multi-producer, multi-consumer queue. So you have a bunch of threads pushing to the queue and a bunch of threads can pull from the queue and items in the queue. What might be nicer is uh, multiple queues, each kind of on their own thread, like stop sharing data with a little bit of work stealing when you, when you need to. But uh, no, we're going to do this queue and this queue looks like a bottleneck because it can be a bottleneck if everything is trying to go through this one queue. So I'm not saying this is the best idea in the world. It's more, I wanted to see if I can make a certain type of queue because it's interesting. It's an interesting challenge. I actually don't do lock-free coding at work day to day because that would be scary. I, I come to talks and I, I, do it, I do it the day before my talks. That's when I do it. <laughs> um, but you'll notice that this, one of these, each one of these might need to be a multi-producer, multi-consumer queue anyhow. So it might be good to build the single queue so you can build more separated queues. So basically, and I gave this part one of this talk last year, and you know, this, this image will just be burned on the screen for most of the talk. Um, it's a queue, like every queue looks like this, has a head, has a tail, has elements in it. And what's the queue look like on the inside? Well, 
if this is just the very high level of a, what a queue looks like, every queue looks like this, right? The queue could be made with a list or whatever you want inside. Um, but I'm not going to use a list for mine. Mine is going to be a solid contiguous buffer, right? Of some things. And it's going to be a circular buffer, right? So you can, you know, head isn't always before tail. Head can be on the other side of tail because you've wrapped around. And I'm going to have to make a compromise right, right away. For now, it's a buffer of integers. Don't want to do anything fancy, just buffer of integers. Um, I like to call that a optimization because it's a compromise for the sake of optimization. And everything I'm doing, because as soon as you step into lock free, you're doing it for the sake of optimization and you're going to constantly compromise. So I'm compromising saying I can only store ints right now. And if you look up optimization in Google, it is a word. It's, uh, you know, there, and uh, indistinct youth in hound T without optimizing the <laughs> histotic toe file of the existing tetanus. So I'm not sure what it means, but it's obviously a word. Is Chandler here? I wanted to tease him in Google. Oh. <laughs> uh, to give him credit, the first, the very first thing you find is optimization, and that's talking about the Compton effect on uh, scattering of X-rays. Um, but the next two pages were like OCR errors. Uh, anyhow, uh, speaking of Chandler, he, every time he sees me talk about this, he cringes because in normal coding, uh, uh, contiguous, you know, every, the rule is just use vector, right? It's like, it doesn't matter what your data structure is, use vector because your data is going to be close and it's going to be in the cache and everything's going to be really fast. But there's a problem when you put everything in your cache and really close when you're doing lock-free programming. Because if I try to do an atomic operation on X and someone else, another thread is doing atomic operation on Y, if these are close together and on the same cache line, then even though they should be independent uh, atomic operations, they'll actually collide on the cache line and it'll slow things down. And that's called false sharing. So I potentially have a problem with having everything together um, and, and we'd have this false sharing problem. And there's ways to get around it by just putting space in between your items, but then you're losing locality. Yes, Dave? Do you really intend to give people internal access to this queue? No. Okay. But I don't see, I'm not going to give internal access to the queue, but I don't see how that. Well, then, I guess if the tail wraps around and is near the head, then you could have a potential flush. Well, yeah, there's, there's multiple problems, right? There's, there's yeah, if, if tail mu gets near head, you're going to have some fall sharing problems. If there's multiple threads trying to add at the same time, which is probably a collision anyhow, so it's not really false sharing, it's true sharing. Yeah, it's, it might not be that bad, right? But it's something to keep in mind. Um, there's actually ways around it without adding space in, in the middle of your buffer anyhow. But, uh, you know, I'm just gonna, I just, this slide is here to say I'm gonna ignore, ignore that problem. Um, and especially, you'll definitely have false sharing between head and tail, because they're sitting side by side. And you'll have one thread that's pushing, one thread that's popping, and they're gonna be colliding on head and tail. Uh, so you would probably put some space in between them just to avoid that. But assume that, you know, we've done the right thing there. So here's our, our queue. It's got a head, a tail. Um, and for my queue, we don't really have a head and tail. We have a head-ish and a tail-ish. Because those variables won't necessarily be up to date. They will be s slightly behind. And maybe tail will be pointing here, although the real tail is there. Right? And the real head's there. Or sorry, there. But head's falling behind. And we'll just have to deal with that. That's kind of the whole crux of this queue. And tail will just go until it finds the first non-data and, and it'll know that's, that's the real tail. And head will go until it finds the first real data. How do you know what's data and what's non-data? Well, let's make a optimization and say that zero is non-data, right? That's, that's simple. It's like you, integers, any integer you want to put in the queue except for zero. But then we have this problem as the queue moves along and now tail is looking for non-data, but it's really looking for this non-data, not that non-data. So we'll have to, another optimization, say, well, you can't have one either, right? And you can imagine as the queue goes around, oh, and by the way, head is also screwed here because he's, he's trying to, We'll get back to this problem. This is a really good part, but I'm just get, just look at tail for a second. Head's actually more screwed than tail is, but um, 
you know, we'll wrap around and then therefore these will have to be twos and then eventually we'll have fours and fives and, you know, okay, so what, what have we done here? How, how, much, how much have we taken away from your integers? Well, you know, how big is this complementization? It's like, well, you've got these non-data numbers and you've got real numbers. Well, the real numbers are black, obviously, and the non-numbers are red. That's, which does mean it's only one bit that we have to worry about, right? So imagine that these are all negative numbers and you can only put positive numbers in your queue or if you prefer negative numbers over positive numbers, switch it around, I don't really care. Um, and we're only taking one bit off your integer. Not a big deal. Um, so we have this other, in the last year I had another optimization of sticking the generation, because we're going to have to keep track of what generation we're on as we, go, as we move around. And I used to stick that generation up in the tail, right, and just pack it in together. And this time I said, no, let's not do that. Let's have generation separate. I think it can be a separate variable. It doesn't have to be crammed in together. So let's not make that optimization. And this is about where we left off, other than the fact that nothing's atomic and stuff like that. This is kind of the cue we had last year and last year, the theme of the talk was walking through a forest of poison ivy. So I really did. I used, I, used where I, I used to work at Blackberry, and we had a forest out back, and I took many walks in this forest before I ever noticed that. <laughs> so you just stay on the path, right? That's, that's the guide to coding. Stay on the path. Don't veer off into the lock free land. Um, and when we had exited our trip last year, we were basically at, at this, give or take, it looked kind of like this. Um, but now we have to tread into darker, less trodden path here. Um, I mentioned that there's a problem here. Like we've got tail now, tail can now see data versus non-data, but head has a problem in that he wants to find the first real data, which he wants to find this one, but head's gonna find that one. Cause he says, there's data. It's the first data I found, right? But it really wants that one and tail really wants to go all the way around. So we're, you know, how often does head get that far behind? Hardly ever probably, but the one day it does, you're gonna crash, because you're gonna, find, not crash, but you'll get the wrong results. Um, so head's got a problem here. He also, you know, he found what he thought was real, the first data, but that's the first data. He also needs to have a generation count. So he has to know that, he has to look for the first data of the correct generation. He has to know that he's on generation zero this is not the right thing, that's the right thing, right? He has to tell those two apart. And of course, we have that same problem is eventually he's gonna be up to generation five, generation six. So, what are we gonna do? This is an integer buffer. How much, you know, now it's like, uh, well, okay, take like half your bits, right? Was just, I was just taking one bit before, but now I need half your bits. And it's like, okay, you can go up to 65,000 or, so it's like, no, I'm not gonna make that optimization. Yes, Dave? Yeah, can you flip back and forth between one and zero? No, because I, you could go around a couple of times. Like, like, how often is it gonna happen? Like if you would write the code and then you would never notice the bug until five years later. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah I thought about that. I, I don't think it's, it's gonna work. So anyhow, I'm not gonna comp compromise on taking more bits away from you. I'm just gonna say that I can make two integers uh, lock free, right? You know, that I just want this entry. Every entry now is gonna have data and a generation count. And if you can't do 60, you know, however big your int is, if your int's 32, I, I'm gonna say I have a 64-bit atomic operation. Um, if your ints are 64, actually I'll probably just say, well, one int's enough. Like, as long as I have enough bits. And I think on most platforms you have enough bits. If you're on some tiny platform that has only a 32-bit atomic, then it's probably a small platform where 16 bits is enough. Or I can make my generation count 256, like only go to 256 and have 24 bits for your number. Like there's a lots of variations you can do there. But on most hardware now, you can just do two integers as an atomic operation. So I still have a optimization though. I still have to have data is not zero because tail is now not gonna look at generation. Tail's gotta look at the data still to know whether there's data or non-data. So the only number I'm taking away from you is zero. 
Um, and you know, if you think about it, I could probably hide that one bit inside the generation count, but it's easier to think about it as the data doesn't exist. Uh, so we have this queue now. Uh, the tail is looking for the first zero of the correct generation, and head is looking for the first data of the correct generation. And in this case, it's happens to be kind of complicated that they're way off, right? But that's, you can, you can see just by looking at the amount of information you have that it should be possible to find the right head and tail. Regardless of where head and tail start at, how far behind they are, it looks like all the data you need to know is right there. Of course, the problem in lock-free programming is you can't look at all the data at once. You can only look at one, uh, one entry at a time. This is a more typical diagram where tail is just a little couple of things off and head's only a couple of things off. And it's, a lot of my slides have the simple diagram, but really you gotta think of the more complicated diagrams because those, those are the ones that are gonna cause bugs. So in the last uh, queue, last year's queue, uh, I had this, the, I had a lot of, spent a lot of time trying to keep head before tail so that you wouldn't uh, overwrite. And in this new version, head never has to consider tail at all because head independently can find, you know, when head's going up here and it's going to find this one and then next it, it reads that and then finds that one, head can tell on its own that the queue's empty. It doesn't have to do any other work. It doesn't have to see where tail is or anything like that. It can, it can tell that it was looking for generation five data. It found a generation four zero. You, you know, we have to see what the algorithm really does, but I, I, I claim that, that, that that's enough to know that there is no data there. And we can tell that the queue is empty. Similarly, last year we had this problem of, you could kind of see, you could see that this, where the edges of the queue were, but as soon as the queue got absolutely full, you couldn't see the edge anymore. In our new world, you can see the edge, same reason you've gone from five down, back down to four. So, this is our, our new path that we're going to, this is kind of where we veer off from, from last year's queue. And we, last year we had a Pac-Man, this time we get to have uh, a ghost, Pinky. Everyone knows the names of the ghosts, right? I'll just assume. Um, so if we're in this situation, we got head there and tail's way over there. And the generation counts four, so Pinky's looking for a four and he's looking for data of four. Tail will actually start here and say, no, that's not a zero four, that's not a zero four. And when he wraps around, he starts looking for a five because he increased his generation count. And eventually he'll come here and say, whoa, that's four, that's less than my generation. I must be done and the queue must be full. That's kind of the, the, the general idea that we're trying to get to here. So is this kind of compressed is this a optimization now that I've, I've added? I tried not, last year I tried not to put the generation count in the entry, but I'm making this optimization, And I'm now claiming like this solves all my problems and it's an awesomeization. <laughs> and now it's time for atomicization. So let's make some of this atomic because we're gonna be doing atomic operations. So the entry is what governs, like these things are just hints, the whole real information is in the entries, so the entries are going to have to be atomic. And, you know, that's, I, I just claim for whatever platform, you just make it small enough to be, to be atomic. Uh, and these head and tail-ish things are going to be laxatomic. What the heck's laxatomic? Or laxatomic? Or relaxed atomic? So, in Herb's Atomic Weapons of Mass Destruction, it's not really called of mass destruction, but it should be. He, Herbs has a talk called Atomic Weapons uh, where he says, you know, don't do lock-free programming. Yes, correct. He says, uh, if you're doing lock-free programming, uh, just use the sequential consistency. Don't, don't do anything less than, and definitely never ever do uh, relaxed atomics because it just becomes too hard to reason about things. Um, but, this class, what it's going to do, it's exactly the same as an atomic, but every single function is going to default to relaxed. So I don't have to type relax all over my slides, basically. I don't know if I'd actually ever implement that class because it's too dangerous, but it's really good for slides. 
So the question is, is this okay if head and tail are always using relaxed atomics? Or, you know, there might be a case that you could, in one spot, use a stronger atomic, but like by default, they're going to use relaxed atomics. Is that okay? So to decide if that's okay, you have to think about what the whole purpose of memory ordering is. And this is a typical, you know, you write some data and then you set a flag saying the data is ready. And what you really need there is a release atomic to say, I'm releasing this data, I'm publishing it. And then some other thread comes around and says, hey, if that flag is set, I will acquire this data and I can now read the data. And what's really going on there, release, you know, you think of it at that metal model, but at the compiler and, and CPU level, what it's doing is says, before means before, which is what you think code always does. You always think this code happens before that code. But unless you have, in, in, that's never true across threads unless you use memory, or, memory orderings. So the release memory ordering says, this really did happen before that. You can't have data.x happening down here. It happened before the compiler or the CPU can't reorder these instructions. And same over here, acquire means this really happens after that. It doesn't, you know, because what happens is anything, like the, the, the processor could say, hey, this ready flag was in one, one cache line and this X was in a different cache line. I already had that cache line loaded, so why don't I load X first and then do ready? And you're like, no, 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 don't do that. That's, the, you know. If you change it to relaxed, then there's no ordering to these instructions. The ready flag will still be set and still be seen by the other thread, but it doesn't guarantee anything about X and Y as soon as you do relaxed instructions, right? So what, um, you know, what, if that was acquire, what acquire does is, is kind of say there's, there's a relationship here between the data and the flag. And that's what release does. And sequential consistency does it even, even stronger. It's easier to think about. So the question is for head and tail, what's the relationship of data? What other pieces of data rely on head and tail? None. Head and tail just hints. There's no real data relying on the values of head and tail. So I claim I can make head and tail always use relaxed atomics. And I'm going to stop calling them head and tail-ish. So they're, they're ish, but, and I think that's a good naming, especially if you looked at code and you saw head-ish, you'd be like, well, wait a second, something's not normal here. But just to keep my slides fit, I'm just going to call them head and tail. I'm, I'm a big fan of uh, uh, a rule of naming. I've got a bunch of them. I, can get, I have slides later if you want them. Uh, one of my rules of naming is be glaringly, glaringly inconsistent when it's important. So someone will see head-ish and they're like, wait a second, that's not normal. And then you go find out what's going on, right? Uh, what about generation? The generation count. Anyone hazard a guess as that what, what kind of atomic need, needs to be there? Of course it's going to be a relaxed atomic because that's more fun, right? <laughs> The only thing, reason it might not be relaxed atomic is because if this generation count is used by both head and tail, they might be communicating between the, the two sides. So that's what we have to watch out for. And so there's our class. So let's do push. Pac-Man eats the data, Pinky pushes the data. So just bam, there's, there's you know, I'm not going to go step at a time. There's the function. Um, the simple functions here, just like, is the data zero? It has to be, is the data zero of the correct generation? When the pointer gets to the end, it's going to uh, go back to zero, but increment the generation count. Very simple stuff. Um, so we start with tail in the wrong spot. Temp loads up from tail. And then we just go looking for the right spot. And eventually we find it. And we jump out, of, you know, that's the little while loop that searches for a zero. And then we hit the spot. And it's, I'm too short. Um, in that buffer load, we just loaded the buffer here. And we saw that it was zero because we fell out. And now we're going to load it again because, well, it was zero a second ago. It doesn't mean it's still zero now in the next line of code. So we're going to have to retry. And what we're going to try to do is write our entry into the spot in the buffer. That's the goal of push. And we're, what we're going to say is, is the entry, when I loaded it, it was 0, it was 0, 4 a second ago, and this local variable holds 0, 4. And we're saying, is it still 0, 4 now? Because if it's still 0, 4, 
then stick my value in it, a P for pinky, and then you, you succeed and you go on. But what might happen here, right when, you know, even though it was zero a second ago, you might come here and suddenly, bam, Clyde shows up and there's no zero here anymore. So this cast fails, you can go back up and you just continue on. And that is the nature of lock-free programming. You fail only when someone else makes progress. I needed John to tell me where they put the only in the right spot, but he's not here. Uh, anyone who knows John understands that. Yeah, yeah, thanks for j the stunt, John. Thank you. <laughs> um, not where I <laughs> Yes? So, uh, on the front end of that, here you have generation five. Yes. How did that come to be? Yeah, th this is always the chicken and egg problem of, of lock free programming and, and, and queues. I haven't shown you what pop looks like. I have to show you one or the other. Assume when things get popped, you leave the next generation. So you say like, I use this push, gets rid of zeros, and pop puts zeros back, but it has to put new zeros back. So this is, those are old zeros, these are new zeros. So it's, it's pop that's putting the five in there, okay? Um, so lock free is, you, you fail when someone else has made progress. So someone is always making progress. A uh, CAS loop loops when there's progress being made. A spin lock loops when there's no progress being made. And they kind of look the same because they're both looping over a variable or whatever, but they're fundamentally different. And that's why lock free is all about someone made progress. And a spin lock is all about not making progress. So anyhow, we come back up to here because the CAS failed and now this C just looks like any other X or whatever. And we come through again and we find a zero again and we try again and this time maybe we'll succeed or we'll have to keep trying and trying. No problem. Um, you'll notice that the only thing that is not relaxed is this one right here. It, the final write into the buffer, that's where you're publishing data, the, the, the value P or whatever your integer you're publishing that data to the rest of the world, so they need to know. And actually, if you're only publishing an integer, and the integer has no meaning besides its own value, then there's still no other data it's related to, so it could be relaxed. But if that integer is an index into some other array that has data in it, then there's a relationship. So I'm going to assume that I need non-relaxed non on, that, on that line. Yes, Dave? Isn't, isn't the, the key thing that makes that need to be non-relaxed, the non-zero-ness of that data? I, mean, I, think, I think what you're doing is you're, you're publishing the, the data is there-ness. Yeah. Yes, you have to publish the data along with that. So, you? yes, you're, you're publishing that there's, there's data there. But if, that's, if, the, if the number is the only data, then you've already published it. If that number refers to some other data, like the number is just an index into an array, then you have a relationship. So if this was a queue of characters being typed on the keyboard, there's no other data beside this, besides the character itself. And it wouldn't have to be relaxed. But I'm going to assume I don't know what this queue is being used for, so I don't make that assumption. Even if that queue of characters being typed had like a timestamp item held somewhere else, suddenly I would need non-relaxed. I think you mean an index into an array that's also being mutated. Yeah, yes, into an array that's being mutated. Not, not, yeah, if it's just static data, then, you know, if it was constant, we'd have no problem. Yes? Yes? Yeah, think, imagine these were pointers, because really, that's where I'm trying to get to, right? So if one thread is doing a not relaxed put, but a parent swap, mm -hmm. but another thread is doing a, a relaxed load, there's no order. One thread is doing, one thread is doing a uh, strong uh, right, but yes, another thread could be loading. That's, that's what I was going to get to. When we're searching, when we're up here and we're searching for the right item in the queue, even that I'm doing relaxed. I'm just, f and, and like on, on many processors, relax is almost free, right? So I'm just flying through this like normal code, just, just searching through a buffer. Meanwhile, some other thread might be doing a strong write to that buffer. That is okay, because regardless of, other things, the atomic value itself is ordered. So that relaxed read is ordered with the strong write. 
there is an ordering there, unless I'm totally screwed. Yes? Trying to follow along. Do you have to worry about generation changing if, for whatever reason, the other head kept going around and you're stuck? I mean, is there a case because we don't reload the generation? So, so, okay, here's an interesting thing about this code right now, as, as you see it. I'm never updating generation, because I forgot to do that so far. So in theory, this code starts at zero right here every single time, and it'll go around four laps before it finds, you know, because it'll actually go, if it starts at zero, it'll go, hey, is this a, a, a zero, zero? Nope. What about a zero, one? Nope. A zero, you know, and then they'll finally get to zero, four, which is pretty bad and inefficient, which is, and also scary that you could probably write test cases and unit te tests and stuff like that, and you wouldn't even see that bug until you got to like generation 20, 30, 40, suddenly your thing just gets slower and slower. But if you just wrote small test cases, you wouldn't even notice. Um, but there, I think you are looking at a subtle problem of, uh, we, you should be keeping in mind what happens if head is changing generation the same time as tail. Because that's the one where, you know, is it okay that they share that variable basically? Um, anyhow, we will get down here. We only had, so the cool thing about that is you have uh, one, two, three relaxed atomic operations and only one strong atomic operation. And I, I'm going to say the relaxed ones are almost free, so that's pretty, pretty good. I've seen a lot of lock-free code, and I've written a lot of lock-free code, where at the end of the day you go, wow, there's five atomic operations here, like strong atomic operations. This is not fast, right? You might as well just grab the lock if there's not that much contention. Nathan? Are we going to end up with something that will work correctly if the Q only has one element in it? W do we have something that works correctly if the Q has one element in it? That's something to keep in mind. When, whenever you're looking at a line of code, each individual line of code, you have to think the Q could look differently than it looked last time. I, I'm, I'm really making it easy for you where I, I don't change the whole diagram on every line of code, right? But yeah, keep in mind, what, what if the Q is empty? What if the Q only has one item in it? Um, so is this good? Like I just mentioned, I should be sometime updating generation and updating tail. Otherwise, we'll be, this thing would get pretty slow if we always started at zero. So for now, I'll just call this update function. But first, more along the lines of what Nathan was saying, um, we should try some more options besides just this one view. Are you going to? What if it's full? What if it's full? Shh. <laughs> I, I, should, I, I just know that you're going to see. I'm just not going to ever answer your questions anymore. <laughs> You pick out every bug in every line of code, which was great last time because that was my whole point. It was bugs. Um, so what if it's wrapped, right? We, d we don't have this simple contiguous, it's kind of wrapped around. And basically the while loop will go off the end and then this will kick in. We'll come back to the beginning and we'll still find it. Works fine. Even if, like let's try that edge case. What if it's right here, like the very last one is right on the edge it still does the same thing, and it'll still land there. You can stare at it, prove it to yourself. That it's not very hard. It's just searching around, right? Unless I like type that code in wrong. It's like three lines of code. Um, yeah. So that's that. That's it working again. And then it gets to that spot, and it'll try to try to set it. So that one works. Uh, what if it's empty? Right. It might be sitting back here, it's a little bit behind. There used to be some items there and they all got eaten and now it's empty. And it'll just go until it finds zero four. That is zero, is looking for a zero of the correct generation. It skips the fives, it lands on four. Perfect. And that's assuming that we know, like head is also going to be pointing here because head ate the last one, head's there, tail's eventually gonna push there and head will continue on. That's exactly where we want it to be. Um, what if tail, like here I started with tail on the, on, on the left of the right answer. What if tail's on the right of the right answer? That shouldn't be possible. Thank you, Sebastian. That shouldn't be possible, right? Because if that was possible, it's going to get the wrong answer. It's going to find that zero, 04 and think it's the right one. But it's like, wait a second. What's this doing searching for 4? How did tail get over on the other side there? And that's my claim, that that's not possible. This is an invariant of the queue that tail with generation together is always less than the real tail. Tail can never be here. It always has to be on the other side, it, taking into account wrapping and what generation you're on. So if this was like, for some reason, generation was so far behind that we were at 03, 
then this code would work. It would look for 03, not find it, come around, start looking for 04, and find 04. And then the next question is, is there an invariant saying generation should never be at 3? Because we've already been writing 4s. How can generation ever be at 3? And actually, it can be at 3. Leave that as an exercise for the audience. And it turns out it doesn't matter. Because if it was at 3, it works. It, whether this can be at 3 or not depends on what push does. So it's hard to know without seeing what push does. And it also comes down to think about update. I have to update tail, and I have to update generation. Which one do I update first? Yes, Michael? Is it an invariant that the end of the queue always has the low generation? Not, not the tail, but the end of the queue. Yeah, that, it's always higher number, lower number. You'll never be low number, higher number. Right. So do you really need a generation variable at all? You can always just look at the end of the queue and say what's in there? You could look at the end of the queue and see what's in there, but by the time you've looked at the end of the queue, it's changed. <coughs> Maybe. You might be able to do it. I'll have to think about that. that's true of generation, too. Right? Yeah, generation could be wrong, too. So yeah, you may be right. That would be nice. Something to think about. Uh, so anyhow, I claim that this one works. And even if the edge of the, the, you know, we're not here, but we're at the edge case, same thing. Tail will just wrap around and end there. That works. And this case, it'd be really good if this case works, because that's the initial state of the queue. So that, that case also works. So Sebastian said, what happens if the queue is full? So what happens if the queue's full? You've looked at the code long enough. Is Sebastian the only one who can answer my questions? Sebastian, what happens if the queue's full? Well, it <coughs> will look for the yeah, wrap around, and then the generation will be ahead of the actual generation, and so it will look forever for it. Yes. Even, even if a place is freed up, it won't find it. Because yeah. it's only it, it'll look forever. If the queue stays full, it'll look forever, because it's looking for a zero. And even if the queue goes empty at some point, it's looking for the wrong generation, and it could just go looking forever. So that's not very good, is it? So right there, that loop is zero. We'll never find a zero, and eventually start looking for the wrong zero. And maybe if it slowed down, the queue would catch up to it and someday. But you know, this is probably running faster than the thing pushing, because you're just running through a queue with hardly a, not even really an atomic operation. So you will just go off to infinity. But eventually, you would wrap the integer, and then you'd um, so we need something, and like Michael was pointing out, is this number on this side is always higher and drops down. It never goes up again. So I can keep track of what my last generation I found was and see if I dip down a generation. That's what this code's trying to do. And say, OK, the queue must be full. And now we should really go through all those cases I talked about a minute ago and recheck them all because I just changed the code. Um, but you could basically that if case is not going to show up and the rest of the code is the same and, and I'm going to claim that all these other cases still work. So I mentioned we should sometime update temp and generation. And what we're going to actually have to do is, oh I lost the, I, I'm going to need old tail and old gen which should be loaded when I load gen and temp there, kind of lost that line of code somewhere in my editing. Um, because what update's going to do, first thing it's going to do is increment temp. Because we, we finished here, we're going to point here and say, well, if possible, we want to update tail to be pointing. That's going to be the new tail. Because we, maybe we're the last ones to add to the queue. So we increment to that spot. And then we're going to say, well, when we started this whole thing, tail was here maybe. And we want to update tail to there if no one else has changed it. And that's what that CAS is going to do. And that's why we saved old tail from the beginning. So we started here and we moved along. But now we don't know where tail is anymore. And we also don't have any idea what the queue looks like anymore because a line of code has happened. The whole queue could have changed. So maybe the queue looks like this, which just a few slides ago I said, We'll never put tail on the wrong end of the real tail, right? It's like, oh, crap. If we're not careful, we're about to do that right now. But once again, I have this invariant. Oh, well, yeah. So if, if we did set tail to that spot, we'd be breaking our invariant that we had just claimed a minute ago. 
And I'm going to say that can't happen. Because what are these 04s doing here? A second ago, we just wrote data for, so I can't get 04 here anymore. I can only get like 05 and stuff like that. So I'll never get this case. Right? This case can't happen. We're great. Of course, uh, right. And so our invariant is, is still OK, because that case can't happen. Of course, this case can happen. I could just go up a few generations. And now we have the same problem. If I move tail over there, it's ahead of the real tail, and I've broken my invariant. So what's going on here? This is the classic ABA. We started way up at the beginning of push. The queue looks something like that. Tail was sitting here. We did all our operations. We wrote, and we want to set tail here. And we go, oh yeah, tail hasn't moved at all. It's still in the same spot. It's like, well, yeah, tail has moved. It was, it was here at A, and then it went around as B for a long time. But next time I looked at it, it's still at this same value A. And that's this awful ABA problem we get in lock-free programming. So, well, how are we going to fix this problem? There's basically two ways to fix this problem. One in green is when we increment tail or temp and we get to the end, we don't reset it to zero. We just keep going forward. And then when we access the buffer, we'll have to do modulo at that point, right? So in that case, if we do this code, tail never will be the same value again. Tail will always increase. Like it started at 67. It wrapped around a few times, and it's at 82 because it's always increasing. Alternatively, we can go back to the original idea I had last year of merging tail and generation. And just like tail is like five, tail five, because it's gone around a generation. And old tail still at four was where we started. Same thing. They're essentially the same thing, Com completely the same thing almost. Um, and thus, the, why either one of them will solve the problem. The, the, I mean, we can tell that tail has changed, even though it's still at the same spot in the queue. So now, we, if we do our work now, we, if tail really hasn't changed and things look the same, well, I mean, these things can look different as long as tail hasn't changed. We will update tail to the same spot. Will be great. And in this case, when we try to update tail, the CAS will fail. And we're like, whoa, someone else has been messing with tail with us. Just don't do it. So now, what about generation? Either we updated tail or not. What should we do about generation? And generation always increases, right? Whenever we wrap, we just increase generation. So I'm going to say, regardless of what else happens, we can try to update generation. Either it's still at the old value and we can update it, or it has changed and then we don't update it. Yes, Dave? I don't understand why you need generation anymore. Because now what you've got is if, if I, yeah. Infinite, well, up to the size of max. Yeah. De depending on, yeah, I'm kind of in like a middle of, middle of two roads path here. Depending on how we do it, uh, I don't, maybe don't even need generation. Um, but it's interesting that even if generation has changed, it went from two to three. If I'm like at generation five, I can still update. I can say, well, it's not where it was when I last saw it, but I'll load it up, try again, and say it's still less than where I know. I, I know we're up to generation five. So you can actually push it forward. The chance of that two line, that loop ever happening more than once is really slim, so maybe it's not even worth writing, but you can actually push generation forward farther. And then I claim this gives us our, we've got our invariant back again. So this is what push looks like. All kind of fits on, on one slide. There's probably a bug in it somewhere because there was a half hour ago. So pop. What, how much time? What, how, am I going fast or slow here? I'm going fast. I have a, whole, I have a talk on naming. <laughs> You, you haven't asked enough questions yet. Yeah. OK. Pop. What's pop going to look like? Pop's looking for the first non-zero data of the correct generation. So it wants to skip along until it sees the x4. Pac-Man's eyes are looking for x4. And push looked like this. 
it's he's only half dead. <laughs> he's kind of squinting. Half dead with glasses? <laughs> yeah, maybe. Um, push looked like this. Pop looks like that. Almost very similar code, right? Which is, I think when you see that push and pop look similar, I feel like I've done something right. Um, but now uh, it's called pop, not called push. That's, that's good. Uh, is data, it's checking for data, not for zero. Um, this is not exactly the same as not is zero because generation still has to be the right generation, but data, all I've changed is from equal equal to not equal there. The check for empty, I'm not checking for full now, I'm checking for empty. It turns out to be slightly different. I don't have to look for the, the drop down change of number. And what I'm writing, because I'm, I'm pulling data out, this CAS will pull the data out and I'm putting the zero in of the next generation, which is when you're asking, where's, where do these fives come from? They come from right there. And the update function now, it's like I'm not updating tail, I'm gonna update head, so it's pretty much the same update, but it. Sorry, I missed what? Since you're doing the initial load relaxed, yes. do you really say it's empty or full as in what kind of guarantees do you have? Okay. Uh, empty or full, we will have to, I'll, I'll have a slide for it. It mostly, basically what you're saying is it was empty at the, for a moment. Yes. So that's all you can say anyhow. Dave? So I want you to tell me why my intuition was wrong. My intuition was that that since you were since you were writing the presence of the element in uh, you were writing that in with the with the release, you were going to have to look. You were going to have to search for for it with an acquire, and you would have to invert the relaxed acquire um, <coughs> semantics. You know, on those two parts of the algorithm. On the on the looking part. I'm only looking for this value, not for any data that that value relates to. And I don't think there's any more information that is involved. It's just the state of this one thing. I am inferring more state from it, but not really a lot of state. Uh, right. OK, I get it. You still get ordering on a single given. Atomic. Yes, there's ordering on that atomic, even though one operation was relaxed and one operation was acquired. The atomic value is ordered. None of the other data around it is ordered. Okay. Yeah, and basically if this, if I couldn't use relaxed in like three or four places, this thing would be a heck of a lot slower. And I have no idea how fast it is anyhow, because I, the code exists on slides, not in code. And I've never written benchmarks for any, any of this kind of stuff. Um, so, we do have a generation problem, which you know, people were thinking about before. We can have this case where head is looking for generation four, but tail is looking for generation five. But we're trying to use the same variable for head and tail. And maybe, like Michael said, you could like, go just to the end and find the right one. But tail is actually still looking for five. If, if you went to the end here, tail, it would work. Tail would like go to, if tail had to, had to start at four, it would actually just wrap around and come back and it would eventually find five, but that would be slow. So I guess I'm claiming I can't go to the one on the end to find the right generation. I can for head, maybe, not for tail. I would have, I would have thought it was the opposite actually. Yeah, I, yeah I, I, I hadn't considered that, so I'm gonna think about some more too. Like maybe, maybe tail can look at the first one and head can look at the last one. Um, so, I have to have separate generation for head and tail. So, I'm going to just make, a, combine my generation and my integer into one class. This entry class is now the same as tail and head. They all are the same generation plus integer. Or imagine it's an integer that goes on forever. The generation plus integer is different because it gives me information about what I'm looking for. If it goes on forever, I, I guess I could calculate what the generation is with a, with a divide or whatever. Yeah, they're equivalent. 
Um, but uh, to make my life easier, this generation, this generation plus value thing will have a conversion to int so that I can access the buffer. I'm going to imagine that that line of code actually works, that it just generates the right less than operator for me. Um, and, and now I've put is data and is zero as part of that class. Um, and I've got an update that'll update either head or tail. It's the same update. So I'm going fast because look, this is all the code. It all fits on you know, one slide. And it looks almost the same. Uh, push has this whole thing about trying to find when it dips down from five to four. It would actually work if that wasn't in there. It would just take longer. So now the question is, does this code work? And what you should be doing is having all these different states in your head. Sure. On, on line one, and then on line two, and then on line three. And then it's like, wait a second, is this all the states? Maybe, the, maybe I haven't drawn a state. Um, I've ignored the state of, of having the tail like this right at the edge here, because I don't even think that's a worthwhile case. But I have thought about having the tail on this side, because you know you always get bugs on the edges. Um, but how do I know that there's not more states? How do I know that there's not actually less states? Because this state is the same as the, you know, it's a combination of it's either that part or it's that part, right? It's just a combination of, tho of those two states. And when you're doing the algorithm, I can't see the whole queue anyhow. I can only see one slot of the queue. So I don't even know which of these is the real state. And it doesn't matter which one's the real state because on the next line of code, it'll be some other state. So maybe I can combine these. And you know, you should be thinking about this of not this diagram, but this diagram, right? This is all I can see when, it, when, when the diagram's going along. So for, the, for the example here, I could be in like any of these states. You know, assuming that this was all fours kind of thing, but uh, you know, basically I can be in these, these kind of states right now. And then when I go to the next line of code, it could be like, what state am I in now? I don't know, maybe it's that state. So every time I go a line of code, just swap in a new state. Maybe I'm in this state now. So the other way to think about it is not these big diagrams of state. It's like, what's the only states that I can have right now? And there's only four states, really. It's like either it's the generation I'm looking for or it's a greater generation. It can't be a less generation. That's to be proven, right? But that, yes? What if generation wraps? What if generation wraps? Then, then you have, uh, depending on the size of this queue, say this queue is a, a decent size, you have added you know, 4 billion items to this queue. Not just 4 billion items, 4 billion items times the size of the queue. And I just don't worry about that case, mostly. Like, you know, like, use a 64-bit int, right? You can use 64-bit int if you, if you have a double wide. It, it, you have to stop. Yeah. I mean, so how long does it take to count to 4 billion? For, for a CPU. Well, if it's a four gigahertz CPU, it takes one second, right? Give or take. Um, you, can optimize it to zero. <laughs> you can optimize it to zero if that's all the code's doing, yeah. <laughs> um, but you know, how fast are you pushing items into the queue? Not, that fa not, not quite as fast. Uh, if you're doing one a second, that's way too slow. But what's four, bi you know, what's four billion seconds? That's 130 something years, you know. Okay, go to 64. What's 64? Two to the 64 seconds. That's 42 times the length of the universe, right? So make a big enough number, or look at your situation of what's the chances this wraps around. You know, how long do I run this code for? If you, yeah, if you're running a server that has to have uptime of hundreds of days and stuff like that, um, I do think you could handle that case anyhow, because it's not like if, you're, if generation is wrapping around, it's not like tail is down here at four. Like you're not that far behind. Tail is 
probably a big number as well. So you can say, I've got a really big number versus a really small number. I must be at the wrap. Um, anyhow, I, you know, this guy's looking for tail. If he finds 0, 04, he stops. If he finds x4, he's got to be, he's got to tell the difference between this x4 where he came from 5 or this x4 where he should keep going. So it's kind of, there's a case there. If it's these two, he should just keep going. And that, that's, that's an easier state machine to, to deal with, right, than, than eight states. I really only have four states. Um, that actually points out a case I didn't write for of when I'm here, I see x5, but I'm looking for 0, 4. I'll go, well, that's not the right one. I'll keep going all the way around the queue and then say, okay, start looking for 0, 5, and then I'll find 0, 5. It's like, wow, you just went by it already. So really, if I start with data 5, I should update my generation count. And, and it'll work either way, but it'd be a lot better if I, if I did that. And so this code, whoa. This, this is the diagram of, you know, think of all your code and uh, all, the, all the states at once. But anyhow, there's, I can, there's an optimization I can do on this line of code. I thought I put the optimization in there, but um, we, can, we can do that later. Um, and there's this other case, the full and empty cases. So we searched around. Who knows where we started? But we said, here's the end of the queue, and we just return. Or we loop around, and we say, hey, the queue's full, and we return. And we don't change head and tail. We, you know, tail started here. We go, oh, it's empty. Next guy comes around and says, well, tail's still here again. Oh, it's empty. It still works, but it's kind of inefficient. And in particular, um, uh, that's not the case. There's, there's other cases where, like some of these cases are like, well, how often is that going to happen? But some of them are like, it could happen a lot because maybe the queue's full a lot or the queue's empty a lot. So you ha have to consider how much extra code to add versus will this case, will this optimization ever be worthwhile? So if you're going to leave because you're empty, you should do the same kind of update to say, uh, you know, if, if tail hasn't moved and, or if tail's behind, even if it's changed, when you do the CAS, it'll reload old for you with the, the value it found. You can say, no, no, th this value has changed, but it's still older than me. You can still go forward. And so you can just push tail forward. And same with that, you can push head forward. And instead of thinking of all these states on every line of code, why not try to look think about what are the invariants. That's what we've been trying to maintain. Like Sebastian right away pointed out, hey, that shouldn't be able to happen. So, we, and we've claimed that this is an invariant. It's not too hard to prove because you can look at the code and say, well, I increment here and I do a CAS there that only succeeds if I go forward. So I never go backwards. So therefore, you know, what you really want is this kind of thing. Can I prove that tail is always less than real tail, never gets ahead? Same with head. Is the range circularly contiguous? How have I proven that I can't have a hole here, even though it's, you know, like maybe it's not contiguous. Maybe there's a hole right here. Did I screw up somehow, right? That's kind of just been assumed and you guys all believe me, but how do we look at the code and prove that that's true? Um, I think it's fairly easy to prove that tail only goes forward because I only increment and I only update tail if, I'm, if it's bigger. Yes, Dave? I have an even worse problem, probably because I'm not a lot free programmer, but, but I even doubt the existence of a real tail. When, when, <laughs> like, you, you explained the viewpoint on this is that, is that different threads can have a different view of what's going on. So is there a reality here? Is there a real tail and is there a reality? Well, that's, yeah. I mean, I, I, I kind of skipped over that because I talked about it a little bit last year, but the whole key of this queue is that the reality lives in the queue, right? And yeah, the, pr the, the question is, if I say, you know, the one thread looks at it and says, here's the first zero, this wasn't zero, this is zero, and then I go to set it, how do I know that's still the tail? 
how do I know like the whole thing is ch hasn't changed and that's not tail anymore? <coughs> if this isn't tail anymore, it's not zero four anymore. Okay. When you say real tail, I think what you're saying is where where should I put the next thing? That's what. Sorry. I think what you're saying is real tail from the point of view of this thread. Okay. Yeah, I'm not saying real tail from the point of view of this thread. I'm saying, I'm saying where should the next item go? for the next thread that wins the race to put the next item. But that's only There's only one place that that next item should go. That's the real tail. Yeah, but each thread, since you're now, has sequential I don't have se sequential consistency. Each thread is in its own universe. Yeah. Right, and that is only after the... And they all agree with relaxed atomics on whether this is the real tail or not. Uh, because... Either this is zero four, and we're on generation four, or it's not. I might be wrong. Well, I, what's the relationship between? Yeah, is there a relationship between generation? I'm jumping in front of you again. Sorry, Dave. Is that? Go ahead. Generation and tail. Generation tail. Are they related? You pull these two things out. They're both yep. separately atomic. Yep. Uh, that's why I kind of skipped past it fast. Remember, there was two ways of. Uh, you know, they were separate. I needed two head and tails. Uh, now I've merged the generation with the head and generation with tail. So there's two generations, head and tail, each have their own generation, but yes. generation is atomic with tail. I, I should have pointed that out better. And if you, I'll just go back again. If you look at the code, uh, push uses tail, never uses head. And pop only looks at head, never looks at tail. And I think that's a good property. They don't collide and they have no relationship between each other. So each one is only looking at the data in, in its own way. And so one's looking for this and the other guy's looking for that. And the data is consistent enough because we have a generation count such that I can guarantee that Either this is the real spot, or it's not zero four. Yes, Michael. Is one of the invariants that there's never more than two generations in the queue at the same time. Never, never more, more than two generations. Yeah, I think there is a an invariant of it's five and four, or, or there's never like six and four. You're never off by one, and there's only ever two numbers. Well, that gets back to what happens if you overflow the generation. I don't think it's really important what those numbers are, just, as long as you can't possibly have two threads, you know, seeing generation four and thinking that those are different blocks. Yeah, threads, well, if, if I don't do some of the optimizations like this, where I'm actually checking oh, less, less than, yeah. but my original version of the code didn't have this in there, and it just looped around unnecessarily. You took that line of code out, and I'd only be checking for equality, then it would actually work even question, if, if is you... That, a good optimization or not? that is a good question whether that's a good optimization or not. I, it, it, that optimization is only about four hours old. Well, sorry, you know, eight hours old. So what, what we're talking four in the morning about optimization. The generation again. Um, if we can deal with the generation wrap, yeah. per se, for a 32-bit generation, can we deal with the first 16? Oh, yeah. yeah. So, it, it, yeah, if, if we can deal... If we can deal with generation overlapping, wrapping around, can we deal with a 16-bit one? I'm just repeating. Right. Can we deal with an 8-bit one? Can we make it one bit? Maybe. If, obviously, if it's one bit or, or small numbers, this can't do. Um, I, I think that goes back to... You have the ABA problem. And yeah. You wrap around. I think I have an ABA problem. And, and like one of my original slides was showing that you have zeros, and then the ones come in, then they turn into twos and threes. And I don't think a small number will work. But then but the uh, you always have the ABA problem. It's just well, if how the, much you can tolerate the time space yeah. to be to say, if, I will never yeah. have but, but 20 minutes it, out. It, it's six. a function of how many threads have simultaneously have an idea of what. Yeah, what it's how many, how many, there's a lot, of, a lot of lock free coding. If you know how many threads you have, you can do stuff. And, you know, if you know how often it's getting pounded on, you can do stuff. 
Um, I think if you just have the, the tail value increment forever, you have a generation built into it so you can mod size to get the generation. I think there's a lot of options there. Um, at, you know, they're, they're, the, the wrapping case, maybe you should worry about. And if you're worried about it, once you get really small numbers, then I can't tell. If the number's too small, I can't tell that you wrapped. Because I can only tell if you wrapped, it's like, because I'm assuming you never get, you know, two billion distant, you know, this thread has been sleeping for so long that two billion items have been added to the queue since it woke up and goes, well, I'm really far behind, you know. I'm not certain here if you've wrapped, if you've wrapped enough. Yeah, if you've wrapped enough, maybe you don't care. And, yeah. You had a question? Let's see where were we. This is the fun part about lock reprogramming, right? It's, it's you're balancing compromises and, and is, it, is it provably correct or is it just like correct enough? Which is a very scary term. Uh, right. So I think this one's fairly easy to prove other than wrapping. This one's fairly easy to prove. And with these, I think I can prove that head is always less than tail in the sense of, you know, they wrap, but the, the non-wrapped head tail, head is always behind tail, which is kind of what you want. Do you have any ordering guarantees, not in the sense of atomic ordering, but if one thread is pushing to the queue and he pushes one, two, three, does one, two, three get pushed in order and does it come out in order? And then do you care if it comes out in order? Because if you have multiple threads pulling it out, you don't care about order. But someone might be using this queue with many producers and one consumer, and then he could actually see if things went in. If a single thread put it in order, you could see it on the other side. Or you might even be just using this with one thread on each side, and you really expect things to happen in order. So do we have any ordering guarantees? And I think we do, but I haven't gone into them. I don't think it's possible uh, for tail to have a generation of three for any of these situations. Tail can't have a generation of three. Tail can't have a generation of three. It, tail cannot have a generation of three. Yeah, that, that is my. The, yeah, I agree with. I agree with that. So your tail can never be. Right. The lowest now that we've combined tail and generation, and they get updated at the same time, generation can never be. You'll never start with generation being a three. Yeah, so however. No. However, as soon as you load tail and it's four. This queue could have 12 in it. So you, I don't think you can get very far on that one. So yeah, you, what we really need to do is, you know, I'm, I'm not going to go through it, but uh, we should be looking at all these things that, well, in the diagrams, I think these are true. Well, does the code guarantee that these are true? And that's kind of the first step towards provability of, of lock free. So, Looking back, this is kind of getting towards the end. Um, last year, we only did push because it was even more complicated. I've simplified it. This year, wow, we did push and pop. That's like almost the whole queue. Um, and we looked at invariance, but I think we should look at it more next time. Um, and I always put up this slide. It's one of my favorite slides. Uh, the guys at Berkeley wrote a OS, you know, a, experimental OS, it's called the Ptolemy Project, and they did like all the best coding practices in 2000. Design review, code reviews, nightly builds, regression tests, automated code coverage, everything. They brought in experts on concert, concurrency. They did everything they could possibly do, 100% code coverage. The thing ran for four years and then deadlocked. Four years of multiple users, bam, it deadlocked four years later. So. Yeah, it's, testing isn't really going to get you there to figure out that your stuff is, is correct. Uh, you have to start diving into provability. There's tools, that we're finally getting decent tools like thread sanitizer and stuff like that. Um, there are provability uh, products where you model any kind of state machine and then prove that these are the only states and stuff like that. So, you know, how do you turn that code into a model that some provability program can, can understand? Because you can't just give it C++ code yet. Um, so looking ahead, 
this, you know, basically we've got this queue. What I really want is when the queue gets almost full, and we have a question of could you tell that it was almost full? Could you just look one farther? That that would get to the point of to see that it's almost full, you would have to look one further, and then you don't really know that it's still almost full, but you'd be like, well, I was close to the, you know, tail is first moment close to head. I don't know if it still is. But could we put a marker there and allocate a second buffer that's twice as big? And then have our circular buffer go here, up here, and then here, and then back here, and then up there, and then allocate another one so it loops around. And question one is, why would you ever want a queue that grows forever? Because if you have a queue that grows forever, you probably have a bug in your code. Because queue should be like pushing and someone should be using that information. But I just wanted to know if I could write a queue that grows forever. The original uh, title of, of my talk was a multi-producer, multi-consumer, uh, growing, shrinking. So I want to be able to remove these items, like these buffers. Growing, shrinking, mostly contiguous, lock-free queue. That's what I'm trying to build. Because I think it's the most complicated queue that I could build. Um, and so eventually what I want to have is an array of entries that manage, you know, we're going to have to ref count this allocation because even if it's empty and I want to get rid of it, there might be somebody looking, walking through it and they can't, do, you know. But this array doesn't have to be more than like 32 because I'm, I'm doubling by twos how big of a queue, you know, at some point I don't have to go any bigger, right? Um, and I don't want to just have integers, right? Integers are fun and everything, but really I want X to be structures, not just integers. So lots of work left to do. CP boost now 20, CPP now, BoostCon 20 instead of BoostCon 10. I don't know when I'll, when I'll get to this. Um, so it wasn't that scary. It's a fairly bright, sunny day that we just traveled through. This is what all the code looks like. Um, I think I stuffed in some of the optimizations. And that is the end of the slides. Um, I have questions. I have bonus slides of some completely separate topic if you want them, but yes? Explain to me why you can't have generation three. <laughs> you can't. Just explain that. Actually, a new thread coming could load a generation of three. If you have a lot of threads that come in. Yeah, you can't have a generation three because all the threads all the threads could be writing new values and you're just like you've got thousands of threads coming in here and they're just writing values into the queue and you never have time to increment tail. So yeah, tail could get way behind and it could be have a generation three but the queue is on generation five. And that's okay because eventually you'll find it and hopefully you never get that far behind. But because what you're saying is, you know, between here and here, between a couple lines of code, a hundred threads, like, because it, it has to be, it's not like the same thread added a bunch of things and forgot to update. It's every thread that came in stopped right here. And how many threads that do you have to have before you start, like, how big's your queue, you know? If I have a queue of 32, I need 32 threads to come in and all stop here before generation goes up. Dave? I don't know, you probably already thought of this, but it seemed to me that, that there might be some value in in thinking of the stuff that you store in the in the queue that's not in the array part, as those are all like optimizations. Like the queue is, it, you know, if if you were willing to go searching through the queue using atomic operations, you could do every operation. But you want tail to be pretty close to the to the quote real tail, so that you avoid doing some of that. Yes, this that this is the whole. Um, the whole crux of this queue is all the real information is in the queue and you don't need head and tail at all. You could always just start at zero at the beginning and search and find, but you loop over and over again. I mean, you could use what generation you find maybe to help you, but yeah, every head and tail and all the work and generation stuff is all just uh, optimization to not do. You just want to start knowing that you're close to the, the head or close to the tail, whatever you're looking for. It, there is a case of, like, you do need the generation to know. I need generation to know that this is not correct. First, I have to find that. But if I always start at generation zero, I'll find four before five. But once we're at generation 100, you don't want to be starting at zero. So generation, it, it is an optimization, but it's kind of essential. 
Yes. Yeah, I mean, you could also you could also just store the the virtual index of that thing in the in the infinite quote infinite queue that you're um, in instead of uh, generation. Store the virtual index where? Here. Where, where you're putting the generation. Right. Instead of five, that could be like you know. It could be sixty-seven because this is the six. Yeah, 68, and this is actually 52 because it's the 52nd element that you've ever put in the queue. For dips, yeah, the, the number going up and down. Um, well, I think it would still work because you still have guarantees about, like, I mean, the, hard, the problem is you can't compare these two at the same time. But if you know that one is always less than the other, or like if you know when you find less that means something, then, then you don't care about this one anymore. Yeah, I think I think you could maybe do that. I just haven't thought of that. Yes. Have you thought about how you unit test? This? How do you? Yeah. yeah, that's. I think about it all the time. How to unit test this stuff? And and. I mean, obviously, you could do unit tests. Just like there's two there's two pieces of the problem. One is is the algorithm correct, and the second one is did I type it in type it in correctly? Because I might have the correct algorithm, and I look at it all, and I, oh yeah, this is right, and I type it in, and I, I type head instead of tail, right? It's like, so y y even if, you know, so you got to like prove to yourself that the algorithm is correct. Then you then you need unit tests just to for that, and then like unit tests of threading where it, like you get one line. That's where you want to use things like thread sanitizer, or like I've done it where I just put sleeps between every line of code to simulate the idea of something else happened. <laughs> None of it gives you 100% confidence. Yeah, so TSAN is, is awesome, right? It'll detect your data races, but T even if you find, even if you know you don't have any data races, there's no guarantee that that you've implemented sensible semantics. And what I what I don't see yet is a description of the of the semantics of this thing. That I, I mean, even knowing how to express the semantics is hard, right? Yeah. Yes, TSAN uh, only will find data races for you. And if I look at all my code, every operation that's on a, you know, unless it's a local variable, every operation is actually atomic. So TSAN's going to say, oh, you have no data races because you did all atomic operations. Yeah, so maybe TSAN's not going to help me. Um, you need, yeah, because it doesn't know what you're trying to do. It doesn't know the purpose of the algorithm. Yeah, that's where I really need to dive into this, right? What are, what, is this, what are the semantics of this thing and how do you prove you have your invariance and, and, and semantics and then prove that the thing implements those variants and semantics? No offense, but I think that's sort of where your investigation should start, right? Maybe I should start there. I, I wanted to see that at the beginning of the presentation. What is this thing we're building? Yeah, okay. Well, you know, I have this habit of coming back every year and maybe next year, it, you know, maybe I'll avoid it because it's scary. Uh, but yeah, I should probably, uh, for any class you write, shouldn't you start with the semantics and say, this is what I'm trying to do here, and then write code that implements semantics. To a certain extent, I'm assuming we know what the semantics of a Q are. Um, I haven't delved into the specific semantics of do I guarantee certain orderings or stuff like that. Because if you don't want, if you want to guarantee no ordering at all, there's other things you can do. You can actually like you can actually like leave gaps and let the next let the next guy insert here instead of here. And there's all these other crazy things you can do because you can just like skip over it because you have no order that that you care about. So other than assuming that you have an idea of what the semantics of a Q are, yeah, I haven't really said exactly my particular semantics. And maybe I should. And I think also we need, we need the semantics and we need the invariance. And then we need to start doing provability. Dave? How big should this Q be? How big should this Q be? Uh, one cache, a fraction of that, as big as possible for one whole. Um, how do you size it? I, well, I think how big the Q should be is totally based on the use, right? Um, I did a lot of Qs on BlackBerry phone where data is coming in from hardware and then some app or process has to churn through that data. Like even if it's just mouse movement, right? Or, or touch movement. You've got all this data coming in and you might fill the queue. And then it's like, well, what do you do when you fill the queue? And, and what you do is you just throw things away. You're just like, 
And I, I've actually done a lot of work where it's like, okay, you can throw things away, but don't throw away the important things. Like, a lot of software gets really screwed up if you get a touch down or a mouse down, and then you never tell it that the touch went away. Like, just because, like, you know, you stopped touching, but you lost that because it fell out of the queue. And then this software is just not, every time you go to touch it, it's like off by one and, and backwards. And uh, so I've done it where I have a queue of, of touch input. I will start throwing out movements actually based on the distance of the movement. Say, so, yeah, that movement wasn't very important. It was basically linear anyhow. And I'll always leave one spot for the up. If, there's, if there is a down in the queue, I guarantee a spot for the up. So every queue, you know, you're going to have different requirements. I do think a queue that grows forever is probably a bad idea. Because, yes? So uh, you said pretty early that if you have five expensive atomic operations, the whole thing will be slow. I, I'm just throwing a number out there, but okay, so I... Yes. How many do you have now? I have four, four atomic operations. Oh, that's not the full code. I load tail, I load the buffer, I do a CAS, which should also be relaxed. Oh yeah, tail's always relaxed. Uh, and I do this one, which is not relaxed. I have three relaxed and one not relaxed. And of course the update at the end. Oh, and the update, which is also relaxed. So Four and one. I mean, on x86 at least, there's no such thing as a relaxed compare exchange. Yeah, x86 compare, uh, relaxed, all the relaxed operations are just there is no compare exchange except oh. the strong atomic one. Oh, right, right, right. Consistency guarantee. So those operations, they may look fast in the source, but right. on the hardware level, they're slow. Right. So you're saying even if I pass in relaxed here, CAS on an x86, it's not. Yes. Because, because, because it's not just a write. One compare exchange operation, yeah. and that one gives it has, you the strong Yeah, the, the, the only... Yeah. The only assembly code I can call is the strong compare exchange. And it kind of makes some sense because you're not just doing a single atomic operation of just a write or just a read. You're doing a, you know, an if statement hiding in there. Uh, so yeah, so this one's still free and that one's still free because they're just loads. Uh, this one's not free and this one's not free. This one, one is an optimization that... Uh, the yeah. two, that the one in the failure case and the one in success case are mutually exclusive. Yes, so the only, it's the exact same code. I kind of, I should have put it back in an update function. Only one of these two happens. Um, this probably only happens once. It, like, it probably won't loop around. Um, so, so, yeah, so, so there's two. Two CASs. Two CASs. Good. I, I have worked, I mean, I, I helped somebody write a, a lock-free or mostly lock-free allocator. And I swear the first version had like nine atomic operations in it. Some of them were just like uh, debug bookkeeping even. They're just like keeping track of how many and all this kind of stats and stuff. But still you're like, yeah, just take a lock, right? But you know, so you have to, yeah, it's exactly what you have to do is walk through and go count them and see, can, can I turn one of these into a normal, you know, not a CAS? Uh, I don't think I can, but yeah. your queue in terms of invariance and state machine, you could probably just generate all the possible states and look through it. There, in the, there is a pro, uh, product, project named uh, Jespen, who is uh, they just, uh, aimed to prove correctness of distributed systems. And since, since you look free, queue is much, pretty much a distributed system. You could do it that way, maybe? Yes. To repeat some of that, there are a few things out there that try to do provability and some doing provability of distributed systems and they, the ones I've seen as well, are based on state machine. If you can describe a state machine and say these are all the states, it can prove that yes, you always go through these states and whatever it needs to prove. Um, and yes, this is exactly like a distributed system. And it's very interesting, when people work on distributed systems or you just think of stuff like over the internet, you know, like oh I'm going to make this this call and it's going to go over the internet, you automatically think this is not synchronized at all. This is going to take forever to, you know. But then when you're coding on threads, you forget that it's the exact same. You're like sending this off to the other processor or to this other thread and it 
doesn't happen instantaneously. It takes time and that other thread, right? If, you're, if you have two people on the internet trying to update a document, well, who was first? Well, what, do you, what do you mean by first, right? It's the same problems. And it's almost like we should think more about distributed systems so that we can do these small distributed systems. Were you gonna say something, Dave? Not yet. <laughs> it might be your last chance. I think I'm done here, so, oh, yes? Yes. Um, and you Should have all these, these CASs on the uh, head and tail to guarantee that. And I don't think it's necessary at all. The only invariance you really need to maintain here is that the tail is behind the real tail and head is behind the real head. You might get a little extra searching, but you can save all the CASs apart from the real, apart from the actual value chain. Well, I need this CAS. Do I need this CAS? It doesn't matter. You might be setting it backwards, 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 but it's like yes. only. Yes, I, can, I could make this a, a set, a store, to say, well, tail was here, I went this far, and tail was here for me. It might be farther right now, but I'm, I'm farther than it was, so it's still better than what I last saw. I might be screwing over, not screwing over, but I might, it might not be the best answer, yeah. but there's a so good chance it's the, best, it's the right answer. You know it's the real tail, so I still know what's behind. Yeah, yeah, this was more, yeah, I think I was only doing this because it felt like, well, if someone else has already updated tail and they're farther along, I shouldn't, I shouldn't go back. I think but it was more necessary in the, when you didn't have the integrated generation and position. Yeah, I, I might have needed it when, when they weren't integrated, and now I don't need it. Or I might have needed them in my queue last year, and I rewrote it, basically. Yeah, so the, I think the, um, if, you were doing this as a distributed system, that CAS would make perfect sense because the actual if and update is cheap and the communication is long. Right. But in this case, the communication is short and the update is expensive, right? Yes, and distributed, yeah. You, we do have different criteria than distributed system of here, I'm trying to just repeat what you said if I can. Uh, in a distributed system, the communication is long, up, updates are quick. Here it's, all, well, they're both quick, so it's kind of relatively, might be, different than a distributed system. Dave? Um, it's, it seems to me that once you discover that your, that your tail or head is a generation behind, you, you just want to go ahead. back to looking in the buffer instead of, instead of like trying to catch up by, by going around and around. If the head and tail are a generation behind, uh, yeah, if I come in here and I'm starting with tail of three and I see a four or five or something, I'm like, I, I'm, I'm way behind. If I see a four, I, there's no sense searching because there's not, no, no, if I see a four, I might still have, like, well, if I see a five, I can still find a four. So I, I, might, I might be a little behind. But if I'm, like, two behind, I don't have to look through the whole thing because I'm only ever, yeah. Yeah, I could, I could just start one. minus start one. one. Or, or like you were saying, yeah, that's what Michael said at the beginning. Uh, the guy looking for tail can start with this number. Guy looking for head can maybe start with that number or vice versa. Or they both start at the end. But we said, I, I, didn't I say like 10 minutes ago you both can't start at the same one? Uh, I think there was a case for that. But yeah, there definitely, you don't have to start. 10, 10 generations behind. But you're never going to be 10 generations behind, hopefully. Uh, no, I mean, uh, what I, I guess what I'm trying to say is that, that doing what I just said can deal with the whole generation counter wrapping issue. It doesn't matter if you're 10 generations behind. Because you can see what's in the queue. Okay, you can, I don't, it's so, don't have to worry about the wrapping generation issue. Cause you can, yeah, I mean, I think we're on the same page in that the, the whole crux of this queue is that all of the information is in the queue. And, yes, and, but you, you don't want to have this. So, you don't need the generation or, okay. If your if your generation is so, strong enough, you can re 
reset you to don't, something that's consistent with the queue. Yeah, you don't and need the queue to cache can only it. have two generations in it. Yeah. You don't yeah. need to cache it. I don't if need. You're, if you're back, like you started off and you were like one behind, but then after a while you're like, oh, I, I'm now five behind. You could just kind of restart back being whatever the current generation is minus one. Yes, I, 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 I think I agree. Um, at least, I think there's a lot of ways I don't need to store the generation. I can, I don't need to store the generation in head and tail. I can look at the queue and find a generation, maybe at the end or, yeah, I wasn't sure when you were saying wrapping, whether you meant like over, 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 going over an int or wrapping in the queue. Yeah, go, going over an int. Okay, going over an int. Yeah, if you, if, yeah, if my generation is so far off because we wrapped an integer, it's just like, Yeah, you, I, you can only have two generations in the queue. If, once your generation is off by two, you're looking at the queue anyway. So I think you okay. need to know whether your generation is even or odd. Well, <laughs> because we talked about we have n number of realities, and they can all be vastly. So you've got to make sure that they all have a unique sense of the generation. You, you might, you might. I'm not sure you actually care that much. Uh, you might maybe only need, I don't know if one, I don't think one bit's enough. You might need two bits even. Like, yeah, I need to be able to count to, count to three, count to four. Because if I'm off, like this, because these generations are never off by more than one. I may still have an ABA problem. You could get into a, a state where you're not contiguous with data. Yeah, you can end up pushing into the middle of the zeros. Just yeah. by it wrapping enough to because the whole that's, state that's is wrapped around basically. You can, yeah, you, you think that you're fine, but you're not. Yeah, I think that's the original. That's the original sense. Um, well, no, but the like last year, I actually had slides of what if I just used a bit, and then I was like, what if I just used and th those didn't work. I've changed Q enough now that maybe I can do better. But yeah, I th I think that makes it an interesting Q. That's <laughs> yes. Yeah, like that, that was kind of my idea before. Of like you should basically need like rock paper scissors. But ah, rock. I find out that that's that's not true because any number of other threads could have got in there and yeah. cycled through it all the way between when you loaded the generation and then as you search to the next one. Yeah. Like it yeah. Have all if the way yeah, if you only had three states, rock paper scissors, yeah. uh, I could load a rock and then be looking well it's not paper or scissors but it's like well it was paper scissors paper, rock paper scissors rock paper scissors now it's back on rock yeah. but you're still way off yeah so you need a if you can if you can get reality from the contents of the queue but you need you need a little bit of information right you need like if if this is just rock paper and scissors and i'm looking for a rock well i don't know i didn't understand well, it's, it's how many bits, right? Like right now, it looks like there's only ever two values. Do I need more than two values? And how many values do I need, right? What if there was only three values? There's the two values in the queue, rock and paper, and I, you know, and, or there's either rock and paper here, or there's paper, scissors, rock, you know, there's only two of them. And I load one of them, and then I go look. I don't know how many times it's wrapped around, and I'm back on rock again. And I think I'm on the right rock. So I can't even look at it and go, Oh, I'm on rock. Uh, you know, if I, if I have rock and I go look and says, oh, it's scissors. Uh, that's too far away. I might be on rock, yeah. but I'm not really on the right rock. The yeah, it's the ABA problem. But yeah, if, if this holds not just rock, paper, scissors, this holds the full count, like you said. I, I think there's a lot of options. And maybe I can have less here because there's more information here. And, and depending on your system, whether how big you can make tail, you might want to stick more information here. Like, I think it's the same size of information wherever you put it. But I think we're done, but I like how I, I'm I can discuss this stuff forever. <laughs> <laughs>